Uh, welcome everyone to uh, this webinar series for this is part of the launch of the second edition of Digital and Social Media Marketing, a results-driven uh, approach book, which we are launching today. So before we start, I would like to uh, mention that all the webinar attendees are going to be in with a chance to win one copy of the book. So there will be a competition for the best question that will be asked during the webinar so you can ask your questions as we go through and you can do it in the chat box so you need to have your name and your last name the question and also what is the pan who is the panelist that you would like to address your question to and on the 6th of may which is our next webinar is where we will be saying who is uh, the winner in the spirit of the book to offer you with a, a strong theoretical framework but also with a practical hands-on advice, we're focusing on the buyer persona spring, which is focusing on uh, your organization, your buyer persona, and how you can build successful digital strategies focusing on content, channels, and data. The three webinar series are focusing on these three key pillars. So today's webinar is focusing on good digital content that really engage in the time of COVID-19 and beyond. Uh, I would like to welcome our first panelist, Olga Andrienko. Olga is the head of global marketing at SEMrush. Olga is also a judge of content on social media awards in the US, UK, and Europe. Olga is among uh, the 25 most influential women in digital and as a rank by top rank. Olga is joining us from the US. Welcome, Olga. Over to you. Hi, hi, Anna. Hi, everybody. Uh, great to be here. And uh, I will be sharing uh, our recent success case about uh, building an online conference. It's sick, right? I'm on a crusade to change that. This is a really cool tip. That is the most amazing thing. For well, a quick few words about the CM Rush, if uh, you guys are not familiar. So we are a digital marketing tool, basically helping SEOs um, and uh, content marketing uh, specialists and advertising specialists. Um, so we, we analyze websites and keywords and uh, what ranks on Google and what kind of content that you need to use. And our main audience uh, was um, well, now still is the SEOs. So uh, we had uh, an idea, our audience is global. We have over 5 million uh, people in our database who use the tool now. We wanted to expand uh, the uh, tool to new audiences. We wanted to have a global campaign. And we also are known for well, uh, a lot of webinars. And uh, we wanted to set uh, new and like really high standards in, uh, in the online conference space. That's how we came up with the idea of a 24-hour non-stop conference that would be uh, covering all time zones and will be streamed uh, from studios. Uh, we wanted the high quality of sound. We wanted the high quality of the picture. So we paid actually for also the TV quality um, image. And uh, we decided we will be picking four cities and streaming, well, four hours um, in each location roughly. You can see the it, well. Uh, it looked like a TV setup with um, um, yeah, with the host, uh, with the presenter, and then two speakers, and uh, that's what every session looked like. We also had this uh, broadcast, as you see in Sydney, London, New York, and San Francisco, in the in top part, uh, in the bottom photos, where we passed over the bot broadcast, so different continents were talking to each other um, in between the sessions. Uh, okay, so that's, that's the promotion channels. You see that actually most of the, so we had uh, more than, uh, we had more than 50,000 people joining and eventually, and uh, most of uh, the people, they came from ads. So because we want a new audience, we uh, invested 
more in ads and we used the look like audience. So first of all, we struggled really with the, uh, with the leads. But then once people started registering, then we uh, collected the lookalike audi audience that you could do with Facebook. And um, then uh, we asked Facebook to show the ads like, to the same audience we wanted. And then that's how we covered like most of the audience with ads. So over what 30,000 people came from Facebook. Uh, behind the scenes was a really tough uh, thing to do and then the execution was uh, really hard so I just wanted to really share how big the team was during the live stream so we had YouTube live chat uh, with uh, people moderating the chat we had uh, also customer success helping with uh, with questions like the stream is not working or where could I access the recording we had live tweeting non-stop for 24 hours uh, with four people taking shifts, uh, we constantly monitored social media and we had over 6,000 tweets over there. And also, basically, we had people in the studio. So it was 2016 members working uh, well um, in, the, in the day of the launch. Um, yeah, so that's the result. So you can see that we, we achieved our goal. We had not even 30, but we had 56,000 people. We also did... Um, post promotion campaigns with uh, emails and then with uh, we released YouTube, we released the podcast series and uh, we also got additional uh, um, registrants after the award, after the uh, conference and um, cost per well, acquisition uh, well cost really was really really low um, actually uh, com well compared to um, the average so it was uh, less than seven dollars eventually with Facebook the cost per lead was two dollars which is insanely low for uh, something like this uh, and we got uh, over 60 percent of new leads meaning that was completely new audience for SEMrush which was one of the highest objectives that's uh, that's it for me thank you very much Olga it was definitely uh, a challenge for such an amazing uh, event to encapsulate it in five minutes thank you very much our next uh, panelist it's uh, Dr. Natalia Wachowski. She is a CEO and founder at Thinks Natalia. Natalia is a keynote speaker, personal branding strategist, and Middle East learning edu trainer. Natalia coached consultants to grow their business through organic LinkedIn marketing. And Natalia is joining us from the United Arab Emirates. So, Natalia, welcome and over to you. Thank you so much, Anna, for this beautiful introduction. And yes, sunny greetings from Dubai. Today, I would love to talk about three things. The first aspect is, what is LinkedIn and why should I use LinkedIn? Because a lot of people, when you mention LinkedIn, they're like, ah, really? The second thing is, what works? And the third thing is, what works now and why does it work now? So a lot of individuals, when I tell them that I primarily spent my time on LinkedIn, they are like, well, LinkedIn, isn't that super lame and boring and stiff? Or they say, LinkedIn, isn't that a platform which is just B2B? Or they say, well, LinkedIn, isn't that just something when I look for a job or for talent? And none of that is actually true. LinkedIn went through a massive, I would say, image change in 2017. So since people can also upload videos and there are so many more features that are interesting for millennials, my generation, millennials and uh, younger jumped onto the platform and made it fun, which is amazing. So just to give you some examples nowadays, you can also have LinkedIn Live. And at the moment, LinkedIn is also testing stories, for example, in Brazil. So it is a fancy and a cool tool. Yes, you can use it to look for a job or for a talent or, I mean, you can also use it for B2B purposes. But for me, it's a platform that you can use when you have all sorts of different targets. So if you want to build your brand, if you want to build your personal brand, if you want to learn something new, if you want to network, if you want to expand your social network, if you want to learn something, especially LinkedIn learning is very, very powerful, if you want to learn about trends and so much more. What works on LinkedIn? In the end, you have three different options. You can create content that either educates or it entertains or it edutains, which is a mix between education and entertainment. 
And a lot of individuals are very, very scared and they don't know where to start. And I'm a big believer in what Gary Vaynerchuk preaches, which is start with documenting your journey. So you do not need to start with creating a Hollywood movie with a huge budget, or you do not need to expect yourself to be the next Shakespeare or so. Get it. Embrace the suck, as I say, and start with working literally what you have. Become a content creator by documenting what you see, what was interesting. Share a story. And in the end, your content is all about adding value. It's about helping others. And in order to do that, you need to understand your audience. So in direct comparison, for example, to a platform like Facebook or Instagram, where it's more, hey, look at me. Mm, I'm on a boat. Mm, woke up like this. Hashtag no filter. LinkedIn is not so much about that. LinkedIn is not so much about you. It's about others. How can you help them? What are their problems? What are their insecurities? What are their wrong beliefs? Eliminate that. Build relationships. Give tremendous value. And then eventually invite people to enter your channel uh, or to enter your funnel and then also buy from you. So this is the overall structure. For everybody who never ever was active on LinkedIn and is wondering, so what kind of content can I actually create? You can create simple posts, posts with photos or photo with um, literally articles, um, what else? Documents. Documents are going uh, very, very strong at the moment. So that's cool. Some people also have access to LinkedIn Live. But in the end, I would always start with a, let's say, uh, with a type of content that feels natural and that feels good to you. So if you are somebody who likes to write, don't force yourself into creating videos. If you're somebody who's really great at drawing, don't force yourself to write. Makes sense, right? Work with what you have. And what is working right now? Or why is LinkedIn so powerful right now? Because number one, more people are online because, I mean, there's no boss who looks above the shoulders like, hey, what are you doing? So more people are actually online and um, they use LinkedIn because it's perceived as the platform for grown-ups or for business people. And what I've realized over the last weeks is that the content there is very, very, very basic. Like literally it's first steps. What is personal branding? What is LinkedIn? Why do I need um, online marketing? Uh, what is a hashtag? Everything like that is working amazingly at the moment. Like, I, I wouldn't believe it because I'm like, gosh, that's so lame, that's so boring. Like, you can find that in every dictionary. But because there is a new generation of people online and more people online, and a lot of them have never used uh, digital media or social media before, for them, it is amazing. So this is what I would focus on at the moment. This is what I'm also doing at the moment. And the organic reach on LinkedIn is through the roof. So start with the basics, be active online, and take it from there. Thank you very much for Natalia. That was very, uh, very practical and very useful. Our third panelist is Tina Judic. Tina is a co-founder and CEO of digital growth agency Found. Uh, Tina leads a team of growth partners, analysts, data scientists, and creatives who design data-driven strategies to rapidly take brands from here and now to significant growth. Multi-award winners, founder specializes in SEO, PPC, data, content, and social media. Tina is joining us from the UK. Tina, welcome and over to you. Thank you ever so much. Wow, this is such a delight to be, uh, to be part of this event. Uh, Natalia, that was excellent. I love the fact that your hashtag is passion for digital. I think that's bang on in the way that you managed to deliver that. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you is about getting content right, getting the tone right, uh, reaching the right audience, and reaching the right audience at the right time. So what I just wanted to talk about is some of the stages that we go through when in a pandemic. I mean, this is not something that's normal or usual to us. Um, Canvas Data are a leading consumer behavioral insight specialist, and they shared uh, historically how we as people respond to a pandemic and how we follow a particular pattern through a number of different stages. As you can see here, um, stage one, um, denial, stage two, anxiety, stage three, adjustment, stage four, re-evaluation, and then stage five, the new normal, whatever that, um, whatever that might be. There's a belief that we're very much in the kind of anxiety stage now, but maybe starting to slowly shift towards, um, towards adjustment. I mean, in a matter of weeks, our, you know, our lives have become digital. We're craving engagement. We're, in, we're assessing what's important, and we're all going through these stages together. Um, but we still want to succeed in business, and people are still buying, and they're still very much engaging. 
online. So let's get this content right. I just have a little quote I have here from Robert Rose, who's a content marketing um, strategist and author. Instead of focusing on the right message to the right person at the right time, successful content marketers are creating the right value to the right audience in their time. And it's never more, never more paramount than it is now. So what I wanted to do was just talk through four of the stages and just talk a little bit about some of the content that is currently out there and what's working. So first one being denial. So let's, um, if, if we take a look at Burger King, and you know, the obvious thing for them is their home of the water, and they've changed some of their messaging to um, stay home, removing the um, at the water, and Instagram launched the stay home stickers. Now, this is very much around the denial stage. It's about creating content that's reflecting life at home through the creative. It's appealing to the emotions that are very confusing emotions at this stage because we don't know what is ahead. And at the first stage, it's really addressing um, the situation. So if we then, when we start to then move on to anxiety, so there's certain things that we're now getting, made, getting a little more concerned with, some things that are bothering us and things that are important to us um, as consumers. So as brands, it's about recognizing the needs and the concerns of the consumers out there and really starting to support them and providing them with some of the tools to potentially help them ease easing of their mind, but also help them be, be active and be engaged in their home. The two examples I have here, the time, um, and they spoke to the concerns of people and what they have for other people who might be struggling in these times, and they're providing 12 million free breakfasts for children who need them most. Really important thing they're doing, it's still branded as hands, but it's communicating something very specific that they're doing. Mind, I mean, mental health is so pertinent um, right now. And what they've done is focus on engaging people to think of new ways to keep active. And then they, so they launched something called the 2.6 challenge. So again, it's about that le level of engagement that's actually hitting the right mark of where we are in terms of our feelings. And so if we look at stage three, stage three being adjustment. So this is where we're starting to move away from the, the anxious stage of what this is. And we're starting to adjust to what our lives are all about. And businesses are as well. What you can start to do is start thinking about creating and inspiring content and really starting to see the path to show the way forward, which again is facilitating engagement and involvement. The two examples I've got here, one is a local business, Fully Loaded Pizza. It's a small business that caters for parties and there's not many of them happening right now. But what they're doing is really engaging with their audiences on social, with how-to videos. And they've also pivoted their business to actually deliver packs to help you make your own pizza. Secondly, we've got Team GB. There was a whole build-up from them because we we're going to have the Olympics this year, and that's now been deferred a year. But what they're now doing is sharing great videos of how their athletes are staying fit, engaging, and adjusting. And then the final aspect is uh, re-evaluation. So this is the point where we've moved to, well, okay, we're now getting ready for what that new norm is. So this is really starting to set people up to help them readjust to what new might look like. It's still very much about having empathy, but it's also have, about having optimism as well. The two examples here are Ford. This is a message that's um, a US-based message. and It's communicating to people to say they've always been around, they've always been there to help, and they're here for their users now. So you're acquiring cars, buying cars then they're there to provide that credit support. And then Changi Airport in Singapore, they are still very much open for business. I think they're closing one of the terminals next month. But what they're doing is really showing how they're disinfecting areas, treating touch screens, managing, you know, creating surface protection coating on different areas. So helping people feel really safe when we come out the other, the other side of this. So this then takes us to the new norm. And some of us might have an idea of what the new norm is, or they might have plans for what that is. But the whole piece is, what have you learned that you can apply going forward? What communication channels have you picked up upon? What new values have people got and new expectations, new expectations do they have of you? So I've just got a few little bullets here that hopefully are, uh, are a takeaway for you is, do have a clear plan of action, but be mindful that that could change at any time. Do understand and connect, uh, connect with your customers. Stand for something. Don't be something that you're not. Be humble. Add value. Um, consider the other platforms. There's a lot of people out there on social, TV, engage with your consumers in that manner. Listen and act and be willing to adapt. And finally, just look to the future and be ready for, for your new normal. Thank you ever so much. Thank you very much, Dina. That was amazing. Delivered in five minutes, Charles. It was great and it was also very inspiring. 
And what we can take from it is really creating content that is relevant and is sensitive to your target audience. So empathy is all about relevant empathy. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tina. Uh, last but not least, our last uh, panelist is Dr. Alex uh, Fenton. Alex is a researcher and lecturer in digital business at Salford Business School. Uh, he is. He also created a smartphone project for major sports clubs called FanFit, which helps fans to get active as an official club app. Alex released also a book in 2020 called a Strategic Digital Transformation. Alex is joining us from the UK. Alex, welcome. Over to you. Hi, thanks a lot, Anna. Um, yeah, aside from um, uh, producing our new book on digital transformation, which I think is pretty relevant right now during the pandemic, I also took a lead on the um, social media chapter in the, uh, in the uh, digital marketing results-driven approach book. So um, I'm going to talk about some of those issues which we talked about in the chapter as well around sort of social media content, um, fake news, social media influencers, and, and looking at some of the sort of tools and techniques of which we're applying right now during this global pandemic. The first kind of thing we've been, we've been up to is, is looking at um, fake news, social media and fake news. There's been a lot of uh, fake news around. I was at the um, Social Media and Society Conference in Toronto in, um, in July, and the theme was fake news then. And it's obviously, it's, it's been a massive issue um, recently with coronavirus, you know, spreading kind of fake um, misinformation about cures and 5G causing uh, coronavirus outbreaks and so forth. So it's kind of, um, I suppose, uh, you know, up to us as, uh, as kind of, you know, writers and researchers on this topic to try and, set some of these things straight and analyze these networks and see you know what the where the issues are and so forth and obviously trying to you know, promote better practices while the social media channels try and catch up it has been notable though that even world leaders have been spreading kind of fake news as social media influencers facebook have had to actually change their policies to even correct world leaders when they're sharing fake news which has been really interesting um, this is a network we've mapped out here using um, a tool called node excel which is a um, really good reading in um, social media data, in this case, Twitter. I'm reading in tweets around um, the body coach. So it's been really interesting to see influencers like um, Joe Wicks, the body coach, uh, really grow their influence during this pandemic and creating short YouTube videos. So as Tina was saying, great to see people kind of adding value and pivoting in this situation. So someone like Joe Wicks has really grown his social media following. So as a kind of public health person, it's been great to be able to map that network up and, and look at who the key influencers are, who talks to who, what the network shapes are, and so forth as well. So we use Node Excel there to pull the data from Twitter, and then we use Gephi to produce this visual to create a clearer uh, visual. So it's really interesting looking at how we can sort of map, map out these universes of, of influencers and what's happening in those networks. And, and from that data, we can also produce content, which we're producing um, articles and blog posts about social media influences and, and networks. From there, obviously, we're looking at the, you know, what the shapes are and what the networks are, but then we can sort of drill down a little bit more from a qualitative sense and sort of dig in. So one of the influences that popped up there, she just posted something about middle-class lockdowns with including Joe Wicks. So she becomes a kind of micro-influencer within that network. When we start to drill down into those networks, um, we move from sort of a bit more of a quantitative um, analysis into qualitative. And this is um, I use a technique here, which I used on my PhD called Netnography, which is about studying communities online using a particular set of guidelines. I've been working with Alexi recently as well, um, applying things like social media analysis to understanding more about your audiences and buyer personas and so forth as well. So it's about using that social media data. And obviously during the global pandemic, there's been a real rise of um, uh, you know people using online tools and so forth as well. So now's never been a better time for social network analysis and netnography and, and techniques like that. So the last thing I wanted to share with you was around, um, and I briefly mentioned the, um, the FanFit project. So we're still, this is something I'm working on at the moment, which obviously you know, pulls together this idea of channels, content and data. What we did is we produced a smartphone app that's kind of um, rebrandable to different organizations. Um, and it tracks walking and running and physical activity creating profiles, leads and rewards and creates these digital communities, it pulls in social media content from that organization it can be, becomes an official app. So you can see the screenshot there of, um, this is the from the Red Devils. Uh, Red Devils are a rugby league club in um, Salford. We also produced um, a version for Rangers fans. And Rangers are a huge football club in Scotland. So, so what we did with Rangers is we we, looked, we did a big campaign and we pulled in the, some of the players as um, social media influencers 
board, you'll see uh, a couple of really famous players there which we used. Um, FanFit really was about engaging these sports clubs and the fans for better engagement and creating these digital communities. But because of obviously the downturn in um, steps globally, it's been um, really important that um, you know we're trying to keep people active and so forth and producing that content. So we've been producing things like press releases showing that um, fans are trying to keep up the steps even during lockdown. And we're also working on specific content for fans on keeping fit from home and well-being and working with those key influencers to kind of keep people going as well. So I think that's um, there's never been more important time for um, something like FanFit. So I think that's, you know, our kind of strategy around digital content during the pandemic. You know, netnography, social network analysis, the use of smartphone apps and, and really using that to create communities and and keep people active as well. Thank you very much, Alex. And thank you very much to all our panelists that did a fantastic job to uh, deliver quite a lot of valuable information in just uh, five minutes. We have the floor open now for questions. Okay, so we've got uh, the first question we've got uh, from Miho, who is, uh, so this question is uh, directed at uh, Olga. Why do you think Facebook shares uh, were largest for the event that you were planning? So we just, Facebook, Ads are quite cheap compared mm -hmm. to what LinkedIn, for example, has, and then well, we uh, use Instagram as well, but uh, for that was less efficient. But Facebook just allows great targeting. And once we had the first couple of thousand attendees, uh, then we chose the ones that out of uh, the well, these numbers, the ones that we liked or the ones that were. Um, uh, had a company email and also were new to us. Mm -hmm. And then we asked Facebook to search for the same kind of audience. So the, that way we knew that the profile of the person who was already interested in, uh, in, in the conference. And that way it was just we spent less money with better results. That's great. Thank you very much, Olga. That's great. Uh, question from uh, Martin, question to Natalia. Don't you believe that people on LinkedIn expect to find more work or business-related ads than entertainment-related ones? And uh, what for a company on the business-to-consumer in the entertainment industry, can't it be badly perceived by the LinkedIn audience? So I'm not an ads expert. Everything that I do is focused on organic marketing, primarily through content but also through direct messaging i had mm -hmm. an interview yesterday with a gentleman called aj wilcox he is like the person to go to when it comes to any kind of questions related to linkedin ads we've done like i think a life a linkedin live for 55 minutes simply go to my profile check it out because he answered i think over 30 questions all around linkedin ads and the people loved it so yeah i think aj can help more Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, that's, a, that's a quick one. So the next question is uh, going to Tina, Dr. Susan uh, Atala Bidat uh, from uh, Bordeaux. And she's asking, uh, Tina, uh, do you think that uh, brands will change their CSR or corporate social responsibility communication strategy in the long term so that it is uh, the new norm? Or would you say ideas, uh, these ads uh, you've shown are uh, similar to real-time advertising where brands are just following what is currently trending? Ooh, that's a good long question. Um, look, ultimately, this is, we're, we're in crazy times and we don't necessarily know how we're going to come out the other side of it and what the new norm is going to look like. But what we are recognizing is, number one, as businesses, a lot of us can actually operate from home and we can actually operate digitally, which is a hugely important thing. So we're finding new ways to communicate and we're finding new ways and new things that are important to us. Um, what I would say is businesses just need to be looking at what their ultimate goals are, who their audiences are and what they want to seek to communicate to them. Will we see their strategy change? Yeah, I think some of it potentially will. Others won't necessarily. Some are flying through this. Some are, you know, we've seen the businesses that are performing very well because there is such high level of demand. But then there's other businesses who are really stuck at the moment. They're not able to engage with their customers in terms of generating business. So as a result, they're having to look to how do we just speak to them? How do we ensure that we connect with them so that when we are in a position to press the on switch or go switch, then yeah. we can actually reconnect with this audience and progress with them. So I think there will be a lot of reviewing communication strategies. 
And I think there might be some that aren't quite as long term as uh, they previously were. Okay. Brilliant, Tina. Thank you. Think it's their 2020 strategy, probably everybody. <laughs> Everybody's just going to restart again. Okay, great. Thank you, Tina. And uh, just last but not least, uh, a question to Alex uh, from Sarana City. Do you plan to extend Fancy to other countries or communities? And how would you plan such a launch uh, of this app in a period like this? That's an interesting question. It's something we've been exploring, Alexi, recently, isn't it, with um, some of our students? It really depends on, you know, what we could work with any brands, whether it's sports or, you know, universities or corporates we could work with any brand really we are we are actually talking to some um sports clubs in brazil where we've got some um connections there because again there's this kind of this lack of you know creating online communities it is absolutely vital for sort of engaging um fans you know the ability to kind of create content within that so we've, we we're talking to all kinds of different um brands mainly sport but we are we have also got our eye on other on other brands as well yeah we we we, we could potentially do that and we could potentially localize it. We've also been looking at some potential projects in China. So it could it could potentially be rolled out in that way. But we see it's kind of a, a container for content as well, working with those brands and creating those communities. And there's probably never been a better time for that at the moment, I think, during the global pandemic. You know, people need to feel connected. They need to keep active. And, and obviously the, the mental health and well-being side is is really important as well. Okay, that, that's uh, an interesting challenge. Well, thank you very much. I'm very sorry. Thank you for all your questions. I'm really sorry that we are not able to answer all of them. Anna, uh, over to you. Do, do you want to uh, wrap, wrap up? Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Alex. Hey, great question. So as uh, Alex mentioned, we will be answering uh, the questions also in a, in a future blog post. Just a reminder, on the 6th of May, we have the webinar on channels. 20th of May, we have the webinar on data. So on behalf of everyone, I would like to uh, thank our panelists. They did an amazing job in five minutes. Great. Thank you for spending your lunch with us. And uh, we wish you to stay healthy, to stay safe, and to remain creative. Thank you very much. And we are looking forward to seeing you in our next webinar. Thank you. Bye.